So um, I'm joined by Sue Wood today, and it's just my honour to, to, um, to be able to have you on this platform, Sue, because you are um, and have been for the last 10 years, to me, um, a real inspiration, a real source of wisdom. Um, I met you at a really difficult part, place in my life, and you um, just came at, at that right time and guided me um, and really gave me a reason to kind of get up in the morning. Um, your wisdom around yoga, tai chi and qigong um, is incredible. And I think that's why you draw so many women to you. Um, and you are just somebody who is, has a very, very special place in my heart. So um, I'm great to share you <laughs> with all our other women out there. So I want to start with like you are you have spent a lifetime um, in yoga, in Tai Chi and in, in the spiritual kind of body movement world. Um, and I want your backstory is so interesting. So I don't I wonder if you mind telling us a little bit about how you first got into this world. Well, it, it was really interesting because I was um, sort of coming out of a, a rather disastrous first marriage and I decided to to put myself into my work. My work was being an antique dealer and working in um, restaurants after theatre restaurants. So I used to do the restaurant, then go and sell the antiques and try and sleep. And gradually, you know, it, my, my whole life was around my work and trying to, I think, lose myself out of that disastrous first marriage in work. And I think so many people do that. Um, they try to find themselves within it and try and build up their self-worth and so on. And they know themselves through what they're doing in life. And I just became very sick because I was going against what they call my body clock. And um, which is why that thing is a passion for me at the moment. So I was kind, kind of awake at night, going to trying to sleep during the day, not doing that very successfully. And um, you name it, I took it. And... Um, so eventually I uh, nearly died. And I remember going, I went back home and my parents thought, oh no, I was just tired. And I, and I, it was like a pinball going off in my head. I, it was, uh, um, you know, one of those pinball machines where you thing and then it hits something and the light bulb and I kept waking up. And I realized I was in this place of holding and there was an actual conscious decision. Do I go or do I come back? And something inside me said, you're going to come back, but there's a deal. You've got to, you've got to change and I'm going to put a chip in you. And always from that moment on, I felt that, you know, if I strayed too much on, off the path, this chip would sort of draw me back. And in those days, of course, we're talking about, you know, um, nearly 35 years ago, 40 years ago, there weren't all the alternative things and everybody thought it was a bit weird. And I went to see this doctor. Well, I first went to the National Health. And this is what's so exciting about this period in time. And, you know, talking to, on your platform about this period in time, because I went to the NHS and the NHS says, well, we can give you drugs, you know, antidepressants, painkillers and things like that. Um, and, you know, but that's all we've got. And I thought there must be another way. And I was introduced to this amazing doctor called Dr. Wajid. He was a, a little Indian guy. And I was um, sent there by um, um, my, my then-to-be brother-in-law. And um, he stuck needles in me and um, looked over his glasses, told me to think differently, to eat differently. And I was so in awe about what he did. But of course, in those days, if you did sort of um, homeopathy and acupuncture and things like that, um, those people... They, it's in their blood. They don't necessarily say why they're doing it. They don't make it understandable. So having changed my life, I then studied it. And I studied it with an it amazing... Moment, just, back, yeah. just capturing that moment a bit. So was it, do you think the, the change, because you went from somebody who was kind of a broken person, was it, do you think it was, um, was it changing your diet? What were those kind of sing those kind of individual components that really made a, a, the difference to you? Well, it was the whole thing. I think the the key thing I remember 
you know, going to him and, and saying, you know, if you tell me not to eat one more thing, I'm not coming back. And he looked over his glass and says, you eat to live, not live to eat. And I thought, hmm, you know, <laughs> and, um, but it was the whole thing. It was the diet. It was my mind. It was my emotional health. It was my physical health exercise. It was the whole package. But yeah. the interesting thing about them is they give you your power back. Mm. So, um, you know, when you're doing, say, a, um, a, a, a discipline like yoga or you're doing that Tai Chi bow, mm. you, actually, if you're taking your power back and you're <laughs> using it wisely. And that's a really interesting point, is it? Because we were talking before about this fact that a one of the other things I admire about you so much is that you really do walk the talk. You don't just kind of tell us how to, to live our lives, but you live this very kind of authentic, um, kind of good life, I would say. Um, and so, ha but I think sometimes, I mean, I, I think you'd be one of the first people I'd be picking up the phone to, to say, help with this, Sue, how do I do this? Yeah. Um, and I think that idea of us holding on to our own power is really important. So can you say a little bit about how important that is? So we're not putting people up on pedestals and expecting somebody else to give us all the answers. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, it's a crucial thing. I, I've had a few teachers in my time. I had a wonderful little Japanese guy called Ohashi, who was the first one to introduce me to Shiatsu. And he, um, he lost his family in Hiroshima, or he used to call it Hiroshima. And, and he decided, okay, what can come out of this? So he picked up his two little suitcases and decided to go and heal the West. And, um, you know, there he was with two suitcases, no money. And he turned into this amazing teacher. Mm -hmm. But the, the essence of a good teacher is someone who wants you to find your own path. Mm -hmm. So you become your own guru. You're not reliant on a guru, but that guru actually makes you master of your own destiny. I think that self-empowerment at the moment is exactly what people need because, you know, actually looking at this whole COVID, it's a very, very exciting time. If we make something meaningful out of something that appears to be meaningless, mm. because as as um, humans, you know, we've come so reliant on Western medicine and actually this virus is all about, you know, it, there isn't a medicine for it. There isn't, um, you know, we can't have, you know, antibiotics, we can't have a vaccine. What it is telling us is to look at our own life, to get our own lives in order, yeah. to build up our immune system. So, I mean, something, inanely simple which they're looking at now is the idea that the human immune system is linked to nature which is why so much of my work is designed around the seasons and nature yeah. and going out there so and just because there's so much because there's so much that I, and I know this conversation could be absolutely massive and we're hoping yeah. to see you again but I just want to because one thing I do really notice and have noticed when we've been on retreats together is the level of energy that you have and this um, ability to just keep going and to um, keep doing the things you want to do when we're all kind of exhausted. And I think as well, this time is quite a tiring time for people. So yes. it's so interesting just if we, uh, just to capture those ideas around this body bank account, this kind of yes. energy that we hold. So yes. can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, on the, on the the retreat, um, you know, and this is about the human immune system because the human immune system actually links to your feelings about yourself. So if you're worth defending, your immune system will defend you. If you're attacking yourself, and there are a huge amount of illnesses at the moment where, you know, the body's attacking itself, which, you know, brings me back to the thoughts that you're thinking, because the crucial thing about you know, your energy is also the thoughts, because your, your whole body, your cells are listening to what you're thinking, your brain is saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's like setting an intention, a goal. And when we talk about this bank account, what was so interesting was in the Chinese system, they call it prenatal chi. And that prenatal chi is your ancestors, what they were doing, especially grandparents, parents, and your time in the womb. 
that went to make you. And that is linked to our hormonal system and the hormonal changes that we go through in our life. So it's a, and they call that Jing. And then there's Jing, which is, as I say, this aging process. And there's also Qi, which is your current bank account of energy. And one of the things that, you know, we all need to learn is how to manage our bank account. So we're putting energy in and we're taking energy out. But if we take out more energy than we're putting in, we drain the bank account. And then what happens is we draw on our deposit account, our Jing. And that's meant to sort of go through, you know, the natural aging cycle. But then if we drain on that, in that are the illnesses of previous generations that come through our family line. So, you know, all of us have to think on a daily basis, are we nourishing ourselves by our environment, our thoughts, our emotions, the food we eat, the people around us, and so on. So we're putting in, but we're taking out. And this is, you know, fundamental in those people on the front line that are giving, giving, and giving, and then their bank account runs low. And then you get all this jing being built up. And then that coming through in order to manage your energy. So and then how, way quicker. So how, because often people don't have a choice, do they, about how they have to work and yeah, they have to do if they've got three children or something. Life, you know, happens. So could you give us a kind of few tips, like quite easy tips, that how people can start to kind of put that energy back into their body? Well, I think, you know, the crucial thing is to do, you know, obviously some kind of way that, that's moving the body. And it's interesting that you can go down the gym mm. and you can sort of pump irons and do that. But actually what the, what the body needs to keep it healthy are the subtle moves that really keep you really flexible. And so Tai Chi and yoga, where you're physically twisting and cleaning the body as you move, rather than just, you know, going out and knocking seven bells out of it, is hugely important. So, you know, in yoga, it's a, it's a system where you actually do work on cleaning your body while you're exercising. So you're breathing, you're getting new energy into the body, but you're twisting and squeezing, which then works on the lymph system, which helps to clean the body. But also I think one of the most important things is our mind and spending time just with yourself, just in stillness, just observing the mind. So all of these disciplines allow you to transcend the mind. So just a simple thing is learning to say, focus on a candle, and then your mind goes off on, oh, I must make that phone call, candle. So you train your mind to be still. Mm. Then you're able to observe your thoughts because you're traveling in a realm beyond the level of the mind and you're observing your thoughts and you think, well, is that thought good or is it bad? I will disregard it. So you, in fact, reach this higher level where you're able to observe something and then you're at the position of change. You can change your thoughts. And this is, oh, I think, one of the essence of being in charge. And it all stems actually from the mind. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing, brilliant. So one thing I get asked kind of on a daily basis to teach in yoga is how to breathe properly. And, yeah. um, and you are the absolute expert in breathing. So just to finish off, could you give us a demonstration about how we should all be breathing and in a kind of simple step-by-step -step way? Well, I mean, the idea is uh, obviously because the, um, the breath is bringing in oxygen, it's bringing in energy into the body, you want to try to maximize the amount of breath that you get into your lungs. So the, the key thing is to focus on the different levels of uh, the lungs, if you like. So abdominal breathing, where the tummy expands and contracts on the inhale, means you're pulling the breath right down into the bottom of your lungs and you're cleaning the lungs. Yeah. So can you give us a little demonstration about abdominal breathing? Yeah. So, you... I mean, yes. Yeah. So if I was to sort of place my hand on my tummy, and breathe very deeply. I'd be expanding the tummy on the in-breath and pulling it in on the out-breath. And trying to isolate that breath. That breath is very calming. So you'll always note that all Tai Chi masters um, will always put their hand on their belly, center themselves, 
before they go forward. So it's very sort of parasympathetic breathing. Mm -hmm. Then the idea is to fill the belly so much that then you can start to breathe into the chest, mm -hmm. which is more, if you like, the Pilates breathing, where you're moving into the middle of the lungs mm -hmm. and you can isolate the breath there. So by drawing the tummy in and just isolating the breath in the middle, you're using the intercostal muscles in your rib cage. And then if you breathe right up into the collarbones, so you have the feeling of pushing the hands here and pushing the hands slightly forward to activate the collarbones and relaxing back, you can actually breathe into the top of the chest. Mm. Um, and so the idea is to then do the full yoga breath, which is belly, rib cage, collarbones, collarbones, rib cage, belly. So, um, and that is extreme, and then watching the breath. So mm -hmm. what happens is, and this is a training for the mind, you observe the breath, you watch it flow in, you watch it flow out, but then you pause between the inhale and the exhale. Very, very simple. And you become the pause. So you're watching the inhale, you're watching the exhale, but you're the pause in between. And that helps you to transcend the level of the mind and go beyond it. So you become the witness. So if I was to say one thing out of this interview, I would say that if we allow ourselves to realize we are the experiencer of all this, yeah. aren't what's happening to us, we're having the experience. And I think once you can have that experience, even though it can be a seemingly negative experience, if you're the experiencer, you can pull out of that experience something you need to learn, something that's going to carry you forward. So I think my um, message to everybody is that things happen for a reason. Things happened to me all those years ago for a reason. And then you make something meaningful out of something, maybe meaningless. You pull your learning out and that is what becomes your biggest asset. Yeah. Because you're speaking from the voice of experience. You're not saying, oh, well, you know, um, you know, I'll throw a rope down there to you. You're in a bit of a mess. You say, well, last time I was down there, I went this way. Yeah. And a soul will always recognize, as I do in you, a soul that's done its homework. Yeah. That's yeah. what it's about. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you so much, Sue. Now, I'm sure loads of people will want to know much more about you. And we've only had time for that, kind of to touch on the surface. But it's suewood.com where you've got some people can access more about your company and your videos and the kind of um, thing that you spend your life doing. Right. Absolutely. And I'd be delighted if any of your people want to ask me any questions or get yeah, in touch. I think, with me. Yeah. I'd be delighted. I think what we're trying to do is maybe do next time we do an interactive session and we get people to ask you questions. Yes, absolutely. So much in this. Yeah. I'm only as good as the questions that are asked me, really. <laughs> I'm all in there, but I can't think of what to say, you know. That's lovely, Sue. Thank you so much. Really, thanks so much for your time. Fantastic. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and I hope to do it again sometime. <laughs>